All right, hello everyone. So I'm really excited about this, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. Um, I'm gonna be talking, giving you quite a bit of background because in order to make, for the story to make sense, I have to give you some background and then I'll talk about the flourishing at the end. So I'm from Vallejo, California, which is the city next to Napa, um, near San Francisco. And so my first trip to Brattonsville, Brattonsville is the plantation where my family was enslaved. It's a 775 acre plantation in York County, South Carolina. So the first time I went there, I was about six. I looked around at the buildings, I said, wow, we used to be rich. <laughs> I thought it was great. So I didn't really tell anybody, I didn't tell my father, I just, in my head, that was my uh, analysis of the situation. So when I got a little older, I thought, everybody had a Brattonsville. All you have to do is drive around the South long enough as a black person and you'll find your plantation. So what's the big deal about Brattonsville? But here's what I know now. Most Southerners didn't own enslaved people, didn't keep people in bondage. First of all, slavery was a business and it was a very expensive business. And so probably in 1850, about 1% of Southerners had large plantations like you see on television, very, very small percentage. So this is why Brattonsville is important. Most African Americans don't have a plantation standing. They don't because most of the people who were enslaved were enslaved on small farms. So if you have a plantation standing, um, you don't, you're not in contact with the white people. And if you're in contact with the white people, for most African Americans, the relationship is not good. Either it's non-existent or it's contentious. And so that's gonna be my, I'll hold, put a pin in that, and then I'll talk a little bit more why Brattonsville is so important. Um, Green and Melinda Bratton were my great-great-grandparents. Green Bratton, we believe, was born somewhere between 1835 and 1845. As you know, they didn't keep records on enslaved people, and going by the census records, I've been able to trace back, those are the years. Um, people have asked me, Aren't you, don't you get depressed about this work? Aren't you angry about this? Absolutely not. Green and Melinda Bratton were the first freedmen to purchase land in York County. Not the first African Americans to own land, but they were the first freedmen to purchase land in York County. The land is still in my family. It's about this far from Brattonsville. And um, they paid it off 13 days early. Now the oral history in my family was that Green Bratton got the land from his white father and passed it down. That's what my father told me because that's what someone told him. But we're fortunate enough to have 150 years of plantation records at the University of South Carolina, which is basically unheard of in the African American community. Nobody has those kinds of records. But um, we have 150 years of records that were uh, uh, preserved. And in those records, I found out that Green Bratton wasn't given anything. He worked for that land, and I know what he did. He hauled cotton, he raised cotton, he built an arbor, and there are several other jobs that he did. Believe it or not, John Simpson Bratton, who was his owner, um, held that money for, held his money for him and actually paid him interest on it. Now, the, re the importance of that is that had, if he had held the money for him, and then he could have said, what money? You didn't give me any money. Green and Melinda Bratton have absolutely no recourse. It's the white man's word against yours, and guess what? The white man's gonna win every time. So that's another relevance of Brattonville, so put a pin in that and I'll come back to that. So a little bit about my background. I just mentioned I'm from Vallejo, and years and years of being the only black girl in the gifted class, the only black girl, well, who knew she was black at my private high school in Vallejo. And so it's come time to go to college. And on all my black history books that I'm reading, everybody goes to Howard University. And so that's where I went. My mother couldn't get me to apply anywhere else. She said, Lisa, you need to apply to school in California. I don't wanna to go to any of these stinky schools in California. So I went to Howard, um, historically black college in Washington, DC. Then it's time I wanted to go to graduate school. There was one historically black graduate school in the country. I said, oh, okay, I'm going there. And I went there in business and decided business is not for me and went back and got a master's and PhD in African American studies. So for me, uh, black college, black graduate school, 
And then when I did go to a predominantly white school, that's Temple University in Philadelphia, I studied African American studies. I live in an all black suburb in Atlanta, Lithonia, and I teach at a black college. So I live in a black world, right? So put a pin in that because it's all going to come together. This is the African way of telling the story, by the way. We don't tell a story like this. We tell a story like this, and then it all comes together at the end. So put another pin in that. So Brattonsville, we used to get these in the 90s. My family used to get these flyers that say, come to Brattonsville, learn about Colonel Bratton, how wonderful he was, slaveholder, and come and learn about the architecture at Brattonsville. And come learn. I said, look, you all can go, I'm not going. That doesn't speak to my experience. And I called it happy times on the plantation. I'm not going to see happy times at the plantation. So 2003, we get a notice and it says, um, inviting the black and white descendants to come to Brownsville. Oh, this should be good. But I told my family, I'm not going by myself because I don't know what those people, are they going to ask me to serve or what? So I tell everybody in Atlanta, everybody in, in the area, I have a lot of families still in the area. So everybody came with me. Now the flyer said, bring your, if you have memorabilia, if you have whatever you have, pictures, bring those. I get my ancestors down off the wall, put them in a bag, take them to Brattonsville. All right. So we're sitting there at lunch and the conversation is very sterile. I have not been to a more sterile and you know, hoity-toity uh, event ever. It's, um, you know, pass the salt. Oh, do you like the food? What weather are we having now? And so I'm like, hmm, should I start something? <laughs> Which is my personality, but I didn't do it that time. So, but I did. So we um, get into this other building and they said, uh, they were talking about the future plans for Bradsville expansion and preservation and what they're gonna do. So they said, okay, well, everybody, thank you for coming. I said, oh, just a minute. I said, the flyer said to bring your pictures. I brought my pictures. So I, you know, I have a picture of Green Brad, and I'm sorry I didn't bring it. I can email it to everybody. As you can see, he looks very white. And so um, I started talking about that. Now, unbeknownst to me, well, I knew who he was, but there was a congressman who was from the area, Congressman John Spratt, sitting congressman at the time, is a Brad, white Bratton descendant. And so he was there. So the, the short version of that very long story is that he became a champion for me. He did so much for me and for my career. And I found out about it much later. They said, you know, Congressman Spratt told us to do this for you. He's not the one who told me, someone else told me. Put a pin in John Spratt. All right. So um, we got to be friends. And so every few years I would call him or every year, I said, oh, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine, fine. I said, uh, would you get your DNA tested? Oh, Lisa, I want to get my DNA tested, but my family doesn't want me to do it. I said, okay. Mm -hmm. So I waited a year or so, calling back, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. You get your DNA tested? No, you know, my family doesn't. I said, okay. Another time I called him, did you get He said, yeah, I got my DNA tested. So I wanted to say, haven't I been asking you this before? I didn't say that. I said, oh, you did. So what's your DNA name? Looked him up. We don't match. All right, so that says to me that I'm not blood descendant of the, of the white Brattons. Now, people say, a lot of people in my family would say, we're related to the white Brattons. I said, well, how do you know? They said the ages match up. Okay, back up. John Bratton had, uh, uh, Colonel Bratton had five sons. And as you all know, a man can have a child from 15 on a good day to 80 on a good day, right? <laughs> I said, how are you all seeing that the ages match up? So I said, we got to stop saying we're related to them. We don't know. And in addition to that, black women's bodies were so devalued. The father could have been some white man riding by on a horse, a 15-year-old trying to figure it out. It could be anybody, right? I said, we got to stop saying that. So kind of sort of got them to stop saying that. So um, Congressman Spratt, I'm going to stand here for a minute. 2004, we had the Bratton family reunion in York County, where the plantation is and where he lives. I invited him and he came, sitting congressman. I'm walking him around, introducing him. This is Congressman Spratt. He's walking around my whole family reunion, only white man there. Hi, cousin. Hi, cousin. Hi. I said mm. to myself, I'm going to act like this is normal. 
So I let him do it. So I started introducing him as cousin. Okay, we, I can go with this with you. So he was our speaker and, you know, very, a, a very wonderful person. So let's fast forward to 2022. I started, 2021 really, I started asking the management and staff at Bradsville to help me locate more of the white brands so I could start having a conversation with them. Okay, they were real nervous. What's the conversation about? What are you gonna be talking about? I said, look, I'm not interested in name calling. I'm not interested in placing blame. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in a conversation because we have a shared heritage and we both have ties to this Bradsville plantation and I wanna talk. Finally, so, we get together on Zoom for the first time, January 2022. Very wonderful conversation, right? The congressman has three daughters and they were there. And so um, one of them, okay, let me stop and talk about Rufus Bratton. The short version of Rufus Bratton, he was born 18, around 1820, is that right? Yeah, on my birthday. Rufus Bratton brought the KKK to South Carolina, the Ku Klux Klan, most racist organization, one of the most racist organizations in America. He brought the Klan to South Carolina. He was also involved with lynching uh, a, a gentleman, an African-American gentleman, Jim Williams. Short version, Rufus Bratton to escape prosecution. Now this is during Reconstruction, when black people had some level of protection for federal government, more than we have now, I would say, but that's another story. So to escape prosecution, Rufus Bratton flees to Canada. Federal marshals go to Canada, bring him back to York County to stand trial for killing a black man. Unheard of, because right now if a black man kills, a white man kills a black man, escapes to Canada, what? A white, a black, white man has killed a black man, escaped to Canada. That's pretty much the end of that story now. But they brought him back, he stood trial, he was acquitted, but six other or eight other men were convicted and spent time in jail for not for murder but for um abridging uh jim williams civil rights so that was during reconstruction so that's rufus right head of the uh kkk in south carolina so on the zoom call rufus's great 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 granddaughter says oh i have some documents that belong to rufus if anybody's interested in seeing them, anybody knows me knows I hate to drive. Within a week, I was two hours away, two hour drive to go and see these documents. And so we were, she, she was very lovely. The white was the white Bratton descendant. Very lovely, she fixed lunch for me, we had a good time. And so then I said, Nancy, did you ever get your DNA tested? She said, Lisa, on the last Zoom call I told you I didn't, but I forgot, I really did. Okay, pulls it up, long story short, bam, 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 up pops Lisa Bratton. But I told her before the DNA popped up, I said, if I see my name, I'm going to fall out of this chair. And sure enough, up pops Lisa Bratton, the correct Lisa Bratton. You'd be surprised how many Lisa Brattons there are in the world. But anyway, it's correct Lisa Bratton. And so she's talking to me. I don't know what she's saying. Her husband comes in the room. He says, Lisa and I met. Well, she hugged me and called me cousin. And then her husband comes in the room. And he's talking about related to Daniel Balloon or something, I don't know. And I just remember thinking, I can't wait till I get in my car because I'm really going to have to react to this. I can't react to this right now. But when I get in my car, I'm going to really react to this. So now I find out without question that I'm blood related to the, to the white Brattons. And so um, translation, the white side of my family and save the black side. So what do you do with that, right? So. Here's what we've done with it. And this is where the flourishing comes in. We've been meeting on Zoom since January of 2021. Since then, we have traveled together. We have um, started some projects together. One of the projects that we're doing is uh, restoring the slave cemetery. Bradsville has let it, has they basically kept the grass cut. They have not tried to memorialize the enslaved people in any way. So, that's one of the projects that we're working on together. We are also, um, this was Susan's idea, one of the white descendants. Um, she wants to do a quilt that we all work on together, but we only do it at Brattonsville. So it's probably gonna take us years because we don't go there very much. But um, the time is not the, is not the issue. The, the beautiful part of this is gonna be that we worked on it together 
and we've only worked on it at Brattonsville. So we also went to a, I went to an art, uh, an art experience called Ex Domestication by this uh, African, um, African American artist named Precious Lavelle. And what she did was take ordinary objects that black women have worked with and use them to talk about enslavement, white supremacy, um, racism. So I went and then I called some of the black, some of the white descendants, see if they wanted to go. And they did. So we go to this art exhibit and one of the black descendants and I and three of the white descendants, one of them flew from Connecticut to Durham, North Carolina to come and see this. And so we're experiencing it together and I'll just tell you one piece of it. So one part of it is uh, there's a sign that's like, looks like a dressing room and it says blacks only. So, and if you go in to open up the curtain, it says, dear black people, if you are here, um, you're welcome. Come in, have a seat, listen to some music and think about the rest of the exhibit that you've seen. Dear white people, if you are here, you are showing your white supremacy and you, because you're in a place where you've been asked not to be. And so I was in there, two of the white descendants came in. And so I've since talked to them about it and they said that because I was there, they felt comfortable in going in, peeking in to seeing what happened. But um, anyway, we had a long talk about that. And the, the beauty of this whole relationship is we can talk about that. And I said, she's, and one of them will say, well, yeah, I was exhibiting my white supremacy. I said, yeah, you were, but you know, let's talk about that. So this is really the beauty of this relationship um, is that we can, that we're committed to it and um, we don't have to walk around on eggshells with each other. And we just, really, it's, it's, I don't know, it's just a beautiful relationship. So I'll share a couple of other examples. Um, one of the descendants who came, flew, flew from Oregon the first time we met, we met together, oh, I can tell this part. We met together in September of 2022 at an event that we do every year called By the Sweat of Our Brows. So one of the descent, white descendants flew, my white cousin flew from Oregon to come to this event. So she was coming to Atlanta for a couple of days. So she said, oh, Lisa, let's hang out, great idea. So we go to the uh, aquarium, she says, little boys, go to the aquarium. And we're having a conversation, she says, I told my black friends about meeting you and meeting the, my black cousins. And she said, they were so excited for me. I said, oh, that's nice. She said, what did your white friends say? I said, Marty, I don't have any white friends. I really don't. Because remember, I told you black college, black this, I teach at Tuskegee, I live in a black suburb. And so that really was kind of like a light bulb moment for me. I don't have any white friends. I have white I have a white neighbor, she and I are cool, if she needs something, she'll help, you know, we help each other. Um, I have a couple of white colleagues at Tuskegee, we're cool, hi, how are you, you know, but as far as friendships go, no. So the, here's where the flourishing comes in. For someone like me, who has had basically no white friends probably since high school, really, to speak of, and then to have this new relationship with white family members and the descendants of people who enslaved my family. So I have, it's just, I really don't have a lot of words for it, but it's just been so positive for me. It's helped me as a human being to really open up myself a little bit more and not live in such a, a black world. And it's not bad living in a black world, but it's so much better being, expand, being a little bit more expansive. So there are a lot of things that we're gonna do. The biggest trip that we're thinking about now planning uh, maybe 2024 to go to Ireland together. And that's where the White Bradens are from, Ulster County in Ireland. So that's another trip that we have um, on the agenda. So um, I think that's, I would, I'm really interested in questions. I didn't think I'd get through this so quickly. But oh wait, yeah. Any questions or comments? I, and let me just say this about myself, I'm very open. So I'm not offended by questions and any of that, but I will warn you, if you ask me a question, put your seatbelt on because you're gonna get an honest answer. That's the only way I know how to come. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Have you been able to figure out uh, in terms of the DNA uh, heritage where in Africa, um, so I'm saying you're taking a trip to Ireland. Is there a trip to Africa planned in the future? Yeah, um, that, um, 
that uh, African ancestry is the test to take for that. Yeah. I've tried to uh, go online, and even I can't figure out how to exactly do it, but they're having a workshop in Atlanta in September. And so I said, you know, let me just go to the workshop since I can't figure out their website. So I will be doing that. As far as the white descendants coming to Africa, I'm sorry, that's not a trip I'm really interested in doing with them. You know, I don't know, it's hard to explain. I would love to go to Ireland with them, but them coming to Africa, because we don't share the African experience. Right. We share the Irish experience. And so I'm much more comfortable with that. Yeah, yeah and I've been to Ghana and the other places in Africa, but that's something that I, hmm, yeah. yeah, maybe one day, but not really. Yeah, but thank you, great question. Yes, sir. Okay, so one of the things that I think about in my work is sort of like African-American indigeneity, particularly in the US South, kind of being a manifestation of a sort of like, the unique experience of like our people that sort of come together through like white African, you know, these various ad hoc mixtures of like populations, right? So I guess I was interested in maybe hearing your take on like thinking about the U, like the South as a sort of like ancestral place of like, you know, I often my work is called like the South African America. Um, oh, I guess, so I okay. Guess I'm just curious, you know, what your take might be. Yeah, I, you know, I guess that kind of ties into my thinking that everybody had a plantation, which they don't. And um, I didn't talk about this, but I'll just say this briefly. Bradensville is my father's side, of course. On my mother's side, they were enslaved at Fort Hill Plantation, which is on the campus of Clemson University. Plantation House is still standing. And that was the uh, plantation of uh, John C. Calhoun, who was the seventh vice president of the United States. So that's the other side. Um, but the South as an ancestral homeland, I mean, it really is because most of us, most African Americans can trace their ancestry to somewhere in the South. You know, so that's kind of, of a place that even if they've been in New York for several generations, they can still trace their ancestry back to the South generally. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Yes. Um, I'm curious how this, like your, this research and your family research has informed like your teaching and your academic research fits? Have you done new things or changed how you... It does, all the time. So I've taken um, a historic preservationist got us, named Joseph McGill got us started in spending the night at Brattonsville. What he does is spend the night in places where enslaved people have slept to um, bring awareness to the importance of preserving these places. So he came to Brattonsville, I think maybe 2004, and I stayed with him. There were four of us in the cabin. So since then, I've spent the night at Bradensville, I don't know, about eight or nine times. And three times I brought Tuskegee students there and so they can have that experience as well. But every semester, of course, I talk about Bradensville. And we've done, I've had students do presentations on it um, at, a, at a conference. Um, I've had them, you know, the, we, I teach about it all the time. Yeah, because it's my work. Um, I'm writing a book about it. I'm writing about ways that African, uh, African Americans during enslavement resisted enslavement, as opposed to just, you know, oh, we got to take this. But I'm using the primary documents in the Bratton family papers. The, those papers are at the University of South Carolina. It's the one of the largest collections of private papers that they've had. So I'm using those to talk about ways that people, that we resisted enslavement. So thank you very much. It's been my honor to be here. Thank you.